Hello, my name is Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we're going to be looking at unit number 13, lesson number 8, on the distribution of sample means. Now, this is a follow-up to a previous lesson we had on statistical simulation of sample means, and I'm going to be relying on that a bit. But we're really going to be getting into some of the down and dirty um, formulaic techniques for taking a look at how likely particular sample means would be given a certain population. That's a little bit confusing. So to begin with, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about distribution of sample means. So let's get into that right away. All right, so the distribution of means. Well, a lot of people are very comfortable with the distribution of data. So take a look at that distribution, that histogram, right? What that represents is 450 heights of seventh grade boys in inches. The mean height's 54, the population standard deviation is six, there are 450 of them. They range in height from a low down here around, oh, I don't know, maybe 37 as a minimum, and up here maybe at most 73 as a maximum, right? Now, what we could do is we could come along and we could take a sample out of those 450. So hypothetically, let's say I took a sample that had a size of 50, maybe. I could take that sample and I could calculate a sample mean for it. Then I could do it again, returning those 30 people, take another sample of 30, maybe some of them would even be people that were in the first sample. And I would then calculate a sample mean and then return those 30 and then grab another 30, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I could do this over and over again. These columns of data only go down to, um, only go down to the 23rd element down here. That's okay, there's actually 30 of them, but I've just got three columns of data shown here, samples, and again, each one of these things has a sample mean. Remember, we represent sample means by using that, that bar notation, x bar, instead of mu, right? Mu is the population mean, bar is the sample mean. So I've got three sample means here, but you could take tons of them out of a sample of 450. I mean a lot, lot, lot of them. So many, more than a billion, more than a trillion different samples of size 30 could come out of a population that has only 450 elements in it. Now what's kind of cool is we can look at how these sample means would distribute. And they might have a distribution that looks something like this, okay? So again, this is interesting because these no longer represent actual people's heights. They represent the means of samples that I've taken. Here, I've actually simulated those samples, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Now, one thing that you might notice about this distribution, it's nice and symmetric, it looks pretty normal, right? In fact, the lowest kind of one down here is a 51. Now, remember, these are means. The highest up here might be as high as about a 58, maybe, maybe not, okay? So notice how much tighter that kind of band is compared to 37 to 73. Now again, for this distribution, we can calculate exactly the same kind of stuff that we did up here. We could calculate the mean of the means. Notice these little subscripts. We could calculate the standard deviation of the means. And this is just how many of those samples I took. Again, there are way more than a thousand samples you could take, way more than a trillion samples you could take. But a thousand's pretty good, and it gives you a good sense for how the distribution of sample means would work out. But I want you to pause for a minute and really think about that idea, the distribution of sample means instead of the distribution of the data itself. All right. Well, I'm going to clear this out, and then we're going to get into the lesson proper. All right? Okay, in exercise one, it says, using the normal distribution simulator, run a simulation for a population with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 15 for a sample size of 30. Run 100 simulations. All right, let's do it. I'm going to show you a little bit of the background of my Mac right now. I'm going to go into Google Chrome. Our simulator works well almost everywhere. We also have these for the graphing calculator, but the ones online, man, do they go fast. So let, let's take a look a little bit at them. What did I want? I wanted a population with a mean of 50, a standard deviation of 15, 
wanted 100 simulations, that seems to be the default setting, a sample size of 30, decimal accuracy 2, you don't really need to mess with that very much if you don't want to, and I think I'll put the outputs in my column. And it is fast. Graphing calculator probably would have taken about two or three minutes to do that. Google Chrome or any other internet browser, it's almost instantaneous. Now the most important thing is this set of data right right here. I've got to do something really quick. I've got to pop back into my keynote. I've got to do that for reasons that you don't need to know. But the most important thing really is the data in this column. Those are my sample means. Okay. So I went out and I simulated grabbing a sample of 30 out of this population, and then I calculated its mean, and its mean was 44.34. Then I did it again and got 45.32, etc. And let's take a look at that distribution. It's right here. All right. So these are all 100 sample means. The lowest one, as we just saw, was 44.34. And we have a highest one that's somewhere in here, 54.6, oh, 54.98. Now, the first question that this asks is, does the distribution of sample means appear normal, i.e. like a normal distribution? And we all hopefully remember what a normal distribution looks like but let's actually go back to here because I've got it drawn much more nicely, right? This is what a normal distribution looks like. Nice bell curve centered around the mean, etc. Getting lower as you go away from the mean. And let's take a look actually at this distribution. Now you might say, well, I don't think that looks all that normal. But then again, it does kind of peak in the middle and then it trails off as you sort of go down towards the ends. We only did 100 simulations. If we do a lot more simulations, it will look a lot more normal. And I'll show that to you in a little bit. In theory, if we did every, every sample we could of size 30, which again is trillions upon trillions of them, then we would have a perfect normal distribution of this data. Now, going back into Keynote, Notice that letter B, it says, what is the mean of the sample means, symbolized by mu sub x bar, and then letter C, what is the standard deviation of the sample means, rounded to the nearest tenth? How does it compare with the standard deviation of the population? Well, let's go again back into my simulation. Now, we're building those two things into it right now, but they're not quite ready. Plus, that's kind of limited, so let me show you how to actually use Google Sheets to do some of this. If I click into my results and I use the control button, either on the Mac or a PC, and I hit control A, it selects all of my data. If I then hit control C, it copies all of my data. And then if I hit control V, I'm doing this pretty quickly, but that's why you can rewind the video, it pastes all my data. Now I'm in Google Sheets right now, all right? And I could do quite a bit with that data, but one thing I wanna find is the average, the mean of the means. And Google Sheets makes this very, very simple. I start to type in equals average. I click on it. And now I just click on column A. Close my parentheses. And there it is. 50.05. Let me go over and actually record that. 50.05. Uh-oh. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. And again, how many times am I going to turn this sheet? Who knows? 50.05. Now, one thing that you might notice is how close that was to the actual population mean of 50. Let's figure out what the standard deviation of those means were. Popping back into Google Sheets, STDDEV, DEV equals. I just do that so I remember what in the world I'm doing. Standard deviation, there it is. Column A. And we get 2.557. So I think it said to the nearest tenth. Let's call it 2.6. 2.6. All right. The other thing it asked us to do was to sort of comment on how this compares to the standard deviation of the population. Well, the standard deviation of the population was 15. 
And one thing that we would notice, I'm just going to leave that unsubscripted, is that this is much smaller. Now, right away, what you should know from that, because you know something about standard deviation, is you should know that standard deviation measures variation within a data set. So what we know now is that the variation within the sample means is much, much smaller than the variation within the data set itself. And this is important that the standard deviation is much smaller in the sample means than in the population itself, because we're going to use that fact to really try to figure out, in fact, we'll do it right away in letter D, how likely it would be that a particular sample mean would occur from a population with uh, certain characteristics. So let's take a look at letter D. It says, based on this simulation alone, how likely would it be that a sample of this size taken from this population would have a mean greater than two standard deviations above the mean? All right, well, let's do that. Let's take mu x bar, the mean of the means, and let's, let's add two of those standard deviations. All right, so that would be 50.05 plus 2 of those 2.6s. All right. Well, I didn't work this out ahead of time because it depended on it depended on my simulation results. So I get 55.25 there. So now the question is, you know, sort of what was the probability that one of my x bars was greater than that 55.25. Well, let's take a look. Now, in order to do that, we've got to pop back over to my data. 55.25. That's going to be on the upper, the upper level of it. 55.25. Oh, no, that's not 55.25. That's only 50. Wow, look at that. We're never never above that in our simulation. We come reasonably close, right? That one's almost 55 itself. But remember, we were talking about 55.25, right? And it looks like the answer to that question in this case was zero, right? How likely it is it? It's not very likely. Now, we already kind of knew that from other work with the normal distribution. And what do I mean by we knew that? We knew that regardless of whether we're talking about a population distribution or the distribution of, of sample means, to get something that is more than two standard deviations above the mean is quite rare. Before we leave this exercise, one thing I promised you I'd do is take a look at the simulation when we use more than 100, all right? So let me actually do a thousand simulations, a thousand different sample means it's going to calculate right now. So let's run the simulation. All right, that was quick. I'm not going to go back through all that kind of data manipulation. I just wanted to show you how beautifully normal that distribution starts to look. Look at that distribution when we have a thousand simulations, right? We could overlay a normal distribution on that and it would be just almost perfect. All right. So let's go back and really see the ramifications of all of this. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, and then we're going to move on. All right, I'm going to write down these values before we go on because they were simulation dependent. So we had 50.5 and we had 2.6. Great. I'm going to clear out the screen and let's keep going with this lesson. All right, the central limit theorem. This is one of the most important theorems in all of statistics. And it says, when a sample size is fairly large, say 30 or more, and that's not a very big sample, but it's, it's big enough, then the distribution of all sample means of a given size will be normally distributed. All right, and it doesn't matter. The amazing thing is it doesn't matter what the original population looked like. All right, the distribution of sample means will be normally distributed with a mean, right? The mean of the sample means, the mean of the sample means equal to the overall population mean. So the mean of the sample means will just be the mean of the population. That's kind of cool. But the standard deviation of the sample means 
Well, that will be smaller. And how, in theory, do we calculate it? Well, we take this, the standard deviation of the population and we divide it by the square root. Uh, why do we have to have that square root in there? But we divide it by the square root of the sample size. So exercise number two says, do the results of your simulation agree with the central limit theorem? Well, one thing that certainly agrees, right? Remember, the mu of our population was 50. And then the mu of our samples was 50.05. So that was very close, right? So very close agreement. In theory, if we did every X bar we possibly could have, which we didn't, but if we did every X bar that we possibly could have, those two would be identical. Now, the one that's a little bit more strange is sort of that sigma X bar. Well, in theory, what that should have been was it should have been our sigma divided by the square root of n. In our case, our population standard deviation was 15. Our sample size was 30. And if we do 15 divided by the square root of 30, what do we get? We get, okay, I had a little problem with my calculator there. But if I do 15 divided by the square root of 30, I get 2.74. Now, what did we simulate? What we simulated was that the standard deviation of our sample means was about 2.6. So not perfect agreement but within about one-tenth, which is good enough. And what we're going to be doing from now on is we're going to be using that theoretical result, not one that we simulate. All we were using the simulation to do was really to verify the central limit theorem, and it seems like it worked out well. Now again, this is important because from now on what we're going to be doing is we are going to be using the central limit theorem to actually think about how likely it would be that a particular sample mean would show up given a population with a mean, a standard deviation, and a sample with a particular size. So let's get into that. Pause the video now if you need to, and write down anything you need, and then we'll move on. All right, let's do it. I'm going to clear out the text, and let's keep going. All right, exercise number three. The mean height of adult American males is 177 centimeters with a standard deviation of 7.3 centimeters. What is the standard deviation of the sample mean from this population with a sample size if with a sample size is 50? A little bit incorrect grammar there. We'll take care of that in the final version. But what do you guys think? What would be the standard the standard deviation of the sample means from this population if we have a sample size of 50? All right, well that 177 up here, that's pretty irrelevant, all right? All they want is the standard deviation of the sample means, that's the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n, and that's gonna be 7.3, this guy, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is the square root of 50. And if I do that calculation on my calculator, it's kind of messy but we get something around 1.03. So choice two. All right, simple enough. Okay, write that down before we go on to problems that are slightly more challenging. All right, I'm gonna clear out the text. Let's keep going. All right, exercise number four. Jumbo eggs have a mean weight of 71 grams. All right, so that's our mu and a standard deviation of three grams. Great. A sample of three dozen jumbo eggs, let me just turn my sheet over so we're on to the back side, was taken at a local egg processing plant. So a sample of three dozen, three dozen jumbo eggs. So a sample of three dozen was taken at a local egg processing plant and found to have a mean weight of 70 grams. All right. So this is our sample mean, right? This is our X bar. Right, this thing is our population standard deviation, and this is our population mu. Okay, letter A, simple enough. What is the standard deviation of sample means of this size from the described population? All right, well, this is asking for what we just calculated in the last exercise, sigma x bar, 
all right, which is going to be the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Well, the standard deviation of the population is three. And what was that sample size? Well, it was three dozen jumbo eggs. That means n must have been 36, right? Three dozen, three times 12. So I'll just divide by 36. Now this actually comes out nice to divide by the square root of 36, and it ends up being an exact 0 0.5. That's pretty rare. Normally that's a pretty messy number, but here we have exactly a half in terms of the standard deviation of our sample means. Now letter B, what is the z-score for this particular sample mean? For this particular sample mean, we're talking about this. Illustrate this on the standard normal curve shown below. Well, you've learned in the past that the z-score is always the data point minus mu divided by sigma. It measures how many standard deviations a particular data point is above or below the mean. But now we're talking about the distribution of sample means. So in this case, the z is going to be x bar minus mu. And technically, it's minus mu sub x bar. We'll talk about that in a little bit divided by sigma x bar. Ooh, that's a lot. Well, what do we have? Our particular sample mean was 70 minus 71, right? Because mu and mu sub x bar are the same, right? That's the central limit theorem. All divided by now the standard deviation of the, pop of the sample means. Now that ends up being negative one divided by 0.5 which is negative two. So that's right here. So that sample mean is two standard deviations below the population mean. All right, fair enough. Why does it make sense? Oh, whoop, no, we should go on and do part C before we do part B, D. Using either tables or your calculator, determine the probability that a sample of this size would have a mean of 70 grams or lower round to the nearest tenth of a percent, shade this area on the normal graph. In other words, what we want, and I'm going to grab my eraser just a little bit, and get rid of that, and I'll go back here, is we want to find this area of the curve. All right, and we'll talk a little bit about why we're doing that z value and below, but we want all of it down in here. Now, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do what's called the normal distribution or the normal cumulative distribution on our calculator. That's got norm... C, D, F on the TI calculator. And you can do that in a bunch, a bunch of different ways. And let's kind of go into that calculator right now. Let's pop into the graphing calculator for a second. Oh my goodness, I've got text all over the screen. That's all right, we're gonna live with that. Um, but let's go into our distribution. Oop, I have to use my select tool. Let's go into our distribution. We go into it right here, right? and we go down to normal CDF all right, and pick it. On this thing, it's asking for our lower, our upper, our mu, all of that. Now, remember, we wanted everything you know, below a standard um, sample mean of 70. So I, I set my lower at zero, my upper at 70, all right? My mean is 71, and my standard deviation is 0.5. We have all of that, and we hit enter. All right, 0 0.0227. Let's go back into Keynote and write that down, 0 0.0227. All right, so normal CDF, 0, comma, 70, comma, 71, comma, 0 0.5. All right, and that was 0 0.0227. Two, seven, and let's call that 2.3%. All right. Now, think about this for a moment. All right. And then let's also answer letter D at the same time. It says, why does it make sense in part C to determine the probability of having a sample with 70 grams or lower? What does this probability tell in part from part C tell you? All right. Well, think about this for a minute. If you're the person who's sort of running this eggplant, if you will, right, you might be a little bit concerned about the fact that you had a sample that had a mean of only 70 when the population mean is 71, all right? Because you're a little bit worried. Maybe, maybe these 
maybe the population mean really isn't 71 of the jumbo eggs in this plant. So we're concerned about the weight being too low, not being too high, which is why we kind of ask this hypothetical question, well, what's the probability that we would get a weight of 70 grams or worse or lower, right? So that's why it makes sense that we do a sample of 70 grams or lower because we are, if you will, concerned, we're concerned with a sample weight slash mean being this low. Right? There are other circumstances where we want we would want to have it at this level or higher if we were too if we were concerned that it was too high. And really what it says, what this probability says, you know that 2.3% probability tells us that it is unlikely, it's unlikely the actual population mean is 71. All right. And again, let's think about why that is. Okay. It could be. It could be that the jumbo eggs at this plant actually do have a mean of 71. That could be the case. And it could be that we took a sample of 36 eggs and we got a mean of only 70. That could have happened. Right. But it was pretty unlikely that it would happen. There was only a 2.3% chance based on everything that we knew that a sample would have a mean of 70 or lower given this population. Therefore, it is more likely, it is much more likely, that the actual population that we took these 36 eggs from has a population mean that is lower than 71. All right, think about that. That's a little bit tricky. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to. All right, let's clear out the text. Okay, exercise five. Given a population with a mean of 58 and a standard deviation of 12, which of the following represents the probability of getting a sample mean of 61 or greater with a sample size of 50? Show the analysis that leads to your choice. Well, if you see this terminology, probability of getting a sample mean, well, then we really need everything about samples. One thing that we know already is that the mean of the sample means is still going to be that 58, right, that number. On the other hand, the standard deviation of the sample means is going to be the standard deviation of our population divided by the square root of our sample size, which is 50. All right, again, this is kind of ugly. That turns out to be about 1.697. Now we want to know what the probability is of getting a sample mean of 61 or higher. Now a lot of different teachers will approach this in different ways. Some teachers will turn that 61 into a z-score so that they're only dealing with z-scores. Some teachers will take it right from this. In fact, you can basically just do now a normal CDF, okay? Remember, it always goes lower bound, upper bound. So the lowest bound would be 61, right? Probability of getting a sample mean of 61 or greater. Now, what should my, my upper bound be? Well, all it really has to do is be significantly higher. We could go as high as 100. We could go even higher than that. We could go to 1,000. It really doesn't matter. I'll just put the 100 in now that I've, you know, put the extra decimal, uh, the extra zero there. So I think I'll go 61 to 100. Now I have to put in the mean, which is 58. Then I have to put in the sample standard deviation, 1.697. And when I kind of type that all into my calculator, I'm not going to bring that up right now, I get 0 0.039. And that, of course, corresponds to that low probability of 3.9%. Now, if you've got a teacher that works exclusively with the z-scores, so they only have you put the z-scores in here, that's pretty simple. What we can do is we can actually calculate the z-score for this sample mean. 
So it would be that 61 minus 58, all right, so that's x bar minus mu, all divided by sigma x bar, whoops, which is 1.697. Now I didn't do it that way. Let me kind of crank through the numbers really fast. 61 minus 58 divided by 1.697 would give me a z-score of 1.7. Six, let's go eight, 1.768, that's right. So now what you could do is you could do a norm CDF, put in that 1.768, the upper Z, oh, you're always okay with an upper Z of four or five, I'll just put four, and then you can close it. You don't need anything else because when you work with just Z scores, what happens is that the mean ends up being set to zero, and the standard deviation ends up being set to one, okay? And we've taken care of all of that because we've just turned it into a z-score. But if we do norm CDF 1.768 comma four, we're gonna get exactly the same result, 0.039. So 3.9%, all right? So we do these problems very similar to the way that we did normal distribution problems way back when, except we just have a new standard deviation. That's it, that we have to calculate based on the standard deviation of the population and based on our sample size. So let me pause the video now for a second and write down anything you need to. All right, clearing it out. Let's move on to the last problem. All right, exercise six. In a normal distribution, approximately 95% of all data lie within two standard deviations of the mean. This includes normal distributions of sample means. If a population has a mean of 130, a standard deviation of eight, and, and samples of size 30 are taken, find the sample mean two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above. Round both means to the nearest hundredth. All right. What we're doing here, by the way, is what statisticians would call the 95% confidence interval. All right, We kind of want to see, all right, if we start with a mean of 130 and a population standard deviation of 8 with samples of size 30, what is the biggest sample mean eh, we pretty much expect and the smallest sample mean we pretty much expect? I say pretty much because this isn't the 100% confidence interval, it's the 95% confidence interval. But this is simple enough, so here's what we do. All right, it's all about two standard deviations, two standard deviations. Well, again, one thing that I know is that the mean of my means is gonna be 130, all right, that's this guy. We still need the standard deviation of my means, and I'm gonna get that by doing my sigma divided by the square root of n, which is eight divided by the square root of 30, it's kind of, again, an ugly number, but we'll round it to 1.46. And now it's really simple, right? We want some number that's two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below. So I take my mean of means, and I'm going to add two standard deviations. And that's going to give me 132.92. And then I'll take my mean, and I will subtract two standard deviations. And that gives me 127.08. So we would expect 95% of all of all x bars, 95% of all x bars will fall within those two numbers. Now what that really means is let's say that we did a sample, right? and we end up getting one, let me just change the color of my, my pen or something, that was at 133.12. Let's say I got an X bar that was equal to that. This would be unusual. That would be unusual because it doesn't fit within this interval. On the other hand, if I did a sample of, and I got something like 130.78, this would be not unusual. In fact, it's kind of what we would expect, given that it falls within this interval. All right, so general idea here is that the distribution of sample means is normal, right? And we can use that fact to then predict how likely a, a sample mean would be given a population. 
Pause the video now, write down anything you need to, and then we're going to wrap it up. Alrighty, let's do it. Clear out the text, and wrap this video up. Alright, so much of statistics, and this is a very broad topic, is what's called inferential statistics. Somehow, being able to use information that we got in a sample to say something about a population. And a really good example of that today was that egg problem. Yeah, the egg problem, right? Where the fact that we got a sample whose mean was 71 kind of meant that it told us, sorry, a sample that was 70 kind of told us that our population couldn't have had a mean of 71, which is remarkable given how close a mean of 70 is to a mean of 71. And yet the standard deviations of those sample means is so much smaller that you wouldn't expect one to be that low. All right. Again, it takes time to kind of get inferential statistics, but this is at least a good start. I just want to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and as always, keep thinking and keep solving problems.